Hey everyone and welcome back to another video from Amman Talks NRL Supercoach. In today's video, we're going to be going through a deep dive of the hooker position, uh, trying to pick out who are the value options, who are the best guns to choose when you're building your round one teams. Before getting to the video, I do want to do a couple of plugs. I've created a new Instagram page for the account to try to post, you know, graphics and, you know, stories and reels and things like that during the season. So do give me a follow. I'll put a link in the description below. There's now also a overall group code. I'll put that in the description uh, below as well. And of course, if you are still interested in my um, uh, draw sorting and team picking spreadsheet those are also still available uh, again also in the description below and a final plug as well I am looking for sponsors for the 2024 season so if you have any kind of business idea or any friends in mind who might want to market their business or things like that and want to maybe get involved into a partnership with me um, drop me an email or anywhere on my socials and uh, we can uh, contact but hopefully you guys enjoy the video do drop a like if you do do please consider subscribing as well to the channel if you haven't already let's get straight into it so I'm going to start each of the position breakdowns just taking a look at over the last three seasons how many times has that particular position featured in the top 20 averaging players. So I've kind of went into this in a lot more detail in my best guns video which is uh, out on the channel as well. Looking at the hook position, one name stands out often, uh, Harry Grant, 74 average uh, this season, uh, 78 in 2022 and 74 in 2021. He's just been the best uh, hooker for Supercoach over the last three seasons, and that's quite obvious when you look at how highly he ranks. Damien Cook did feature in 2022. If you go back to 2020, I believe Cook is also there. He had like a 75 average or 76 average. What is worthwhile to note though, is that there's only really one or two hookers uh, each year that will make that top 20. It probably shows you that there is a lack of kind of upside in that position. You, most of you guys are gonna be averaging between the kind of 55 to 65. Really, it's only a couple who actually stand out and get above that 70 point average. Also taking a look at this here over the last four seasons, how many times has that position featured in the top 20? Only a total of six times out of a total possible 80 players in the last four years. So really, it's not a position that is a high upside position, but that is why someone like Harry Grant does always stand out because he's one of the few, well, probably the only hooker in the game that can generally say he has that 100 plus point potential. A lot of them, you know, can throw in that game every now and then, but Grant is probably the only one who can do that on a more consistent basis. So you're going to see him as a very popular hooker option i'm going to preface the video as well that he is the best number nine to go for but there are more questions about that you know in that he's very expensive do we start with him do we maybe go with more value options uh do we want to spend the money in the hooker position we'll get into all that in this video but i did want to give this initial context about the hooker position for super coach so taking a look at the gun hookers unfortunately there was not that many there was only three last season who actually consistently averaged over 60 if you look at a large enough sample size of games Harry Grant, Damien Cook and Jeremy Marshall King. We now fortunately have ownership stats given that the game is open so you can see that Harry Grant is 27% owned at the time of recording. Jeremy Marshall King is 14%. Those are two of the most popular uh, gun hooker options. Now my, I've made my feelings kind of already clear on Harry Grant. We'll have a deep dive on him in the next section as well but I do want to mention Jeremy Marshall King. I think he's probably the next best option to Harry Grant. 639k he's coming in priced at an average of 62.6 but you can see in the bar charts below me i've got to the far right jeremy marshall king based on just his season averages uh, base average of 42 and a total average of 63. if you look at the games where marshall king did play over 60 minutes though because he did have a lot of injury affected games his average actually increases very close to harry grant it gets to 69 and to preface grant also had an average of 73 and a half so when you look at the games where jeremy marshall king did play more minutes he did actually have quite a good output getting close to the 70 average and the stats between harry grant and himself are actually very close 45 and 46 base up between grant and joe marshall king 10 and 8 in the evasive so grant has a slight edge there creativity this is one i thought was quite surprising if you refer back to my best guns video one of the things i mentioned was that the truly elite kind of super coach guns they're very essential and very integral to the way that their team plays and in terms of actually scoring the points that makes sense right so both of these guys actually fared quite well in that regard for creativity. Harry Grant had an average of 15 last year. Jeremy Marshall King in those kind of higher minute games, 16. Even if you look at Jeremy Marshall King though, when he was, you know, if you take into account his entire season, his creativity average was still 13. So that's quite high. That's quite close to someone like Harry Grant. The scoring, not quite as much. Harry Grant did score quite a few more tries than Marshall King. He has an average of seven compared to the three or the two for Marshall King, depending on which sample size you want to look at. But it does give me some confidence in Marshall King. I think it's probably the second best hooker option that I would consider for the start of the season, given that his creativity numbers are actually fairly close to someone like a Harry Grant. 
And I think, you know, the eye test does support that. I think when the Dolphins were doing very well, they had a very simple game plan. You know, their halves are not necessarily big superstars. You know, Sean O'Sullivan and Isaiah Katoa or Cody Nikarima when he was filling in there as well. You know, it was more about kind of having good structures in place. You know, um, Jermaine Nisarko profited a lot and, you know, having a hard, hard-working forward pack. And I don't really see that changing too much this season, which is another reason why I look at someone like the Marshall King as, you know, He's an ever-improving player. You know, Supercoach average has consistently improved over the last three seasons, going up from 49, 58, and then 63. So the Supercoach stats are backing it up. I think the eye test also backs it up, that you can see that he is kind of growing into his role um, as the Dolphins' main uh, number nine. And I think the fact that he's got those creativity stats, he is integral to that team. The draw as well, another thing I should also mention that is a plus for Jerry Marshall King. Round three by obviously is not ideal, but outside of that, he's got games against the Cowboys, Dragons, Titans and West Tigers before the Broncos in round six. That's a, definitely a good set of games, and that's much better than Harry Grant. So I can see someone wanting to maybe save the 110,000 and saying, you know what, if you actually look at the games where the sample sizes were bigger and neither player was unaffected by injury, Marshall King actually fared quite close to Harry Grant, and he's probably got a better draw on paper if you look at the first six weeks. Now, he's quite not the caliber of player, but you are saving yourself 110,000. So I can understand the ownership of Jerry Marshall King at 14%, you know, being that second best for the hooker gun slot. Um, the stats kind of below me, I think, seem to back that up as well. Probably just the upside is just not going to be there as much as a Harry Grant. So you can see in the stats to the right of me, I've got 90 plus games. So this is the amount of games where the player scored over 90 points. Granted, Grant did play more games than Marshall King, but he had seven um, and Jerry Marshall King only had one. So what you're probably going to get, I'd suspect, from JMK is going to be very solid kind of, you know, between the 60 to 75 um, output for kind of the first part of the season, I'd guess. Harry Grant, probably similar. You're probably going to suspect that he's going to get between the 65 to 75. It's just those particular games when you know that Grant has that ability to go 100 plus. Marshall King maybe hasn't quite shown that yet, but I think there is some confidence in the player to improve and to actually get to that. So I definitely view Grant as number one. Jeremy Marshall King as number two. Damien Cook, I've got here as well, 663k, um, very lowly owned at the moment, only 3%. He is a kind of proven gun of Supercoach, although he does kind of feel like he's somewhat on the decline. And also, I think Peter Mamazelis for the Rabbitohs could potentially get a bench spot. So Cook might not be guaranteed for 80 minutes, which is generally something that you'd, you'd prefer that if your hooker can get to play 80 minutes. So Cook, I think just the stats-wise, I think the fact that he's kind of more on the decline. I look at Grant and JMK as more improving players. I kind of just have a general preference where if you're going to spend that money at hooker position, you know, JMK is cheaper than Cook, so that's already a plus. And then I think it's less than 100k to go from Cook to Grant. I think that's a small enough gap to pay up because you know what you're going to get with Harry Grant. You're going to get more upside, more consistently going to be hitting those 75 plus scores. So one of the bigger questions I did want to address in this video, which hopefully you guys find valuable, is the whole question of do you actually start with Harry Grant? 750k, I pulled some questions that I got from Twitter or X or whatever you call it. Uh, is it worth forking out the funds for Grant or could it be better spent elsewhere in the team? So what I wanted to do, a bit of a deep dive, is to look at Harry Grant over the last four seasons and just maybe can we try to potentially predict what he's going to score in the pre-origin period? Because we know that during origin, obviously, he would potentially miss some games, he's backing up, and then also looking at the post-origin run. So what you can see to the right of me is a bunch of column charts. You can see that over the last four seasons, these are his pre-origin averages, 69, 86, 72, and 76. So fairly consistent. Last year was actually his lowest if you look at his pre-origin run. You know, one of the other fundamental questions is, well, 750K, he's got a pretty tough draw for the first four or five weeks, and he's got the buy in round four. Is it worth starting with him, or do you think maybe spend the money elsewhere and then you upgrade to Grant on the basis that he's going to lose some money? Uh, over the first four to five weeks. So I, I picked up his averages against all of his opponents in that pre-origin run. So Penrith, he averaged 65 last year. The Warriors, he averaged 104. Uh, Newcastle Knights, pretty low at only 36. Then he has the buy around four. And then in round five against the Broncos, he had an average of 79 against them last season. So then if you're looking at for the first three rounds of this season, based on what he did last season, he's gonna have an average of 68. And if you look at the first five weeks, it's an average of 71. Given that he's priced at an average of 73 and a half, I'm kind of wondering how much cash is he actually going to drop? Now, obviously not nothing is going to be the exact same as it was from last season, but kind of what it shows me is that he's just a generally consistent player. Doesn't really matter what part of the season he's playing. He's generally always going to be kind of getting you those consistent 70 plus point scores. And so I'm looking at it as, you know, come round six, I'm almost definitely going to want Harry Grant. 
you know, Bulldogs, Roosters, Rabbitohs, Titans, Sharks, Parramatta, and Manly in the run home until the first origin period. If you look at that particular run between round five to round 12, it's an average of 85. So averaging 85, he's probably someone that you're going to want to have. And with the occasional upside, you know, he averaged 123 against the Sharks uh, last season. So my concern with not starting with him to then try to get to him in round five or round six, I just don't know how much cash he's actually going to drop just based on kind of looking at his averages over the last three to four seasons. So my feeling at the moment is I'm probably going to want, I think, to just start with him if I can. I like JMK as, as a potential compromise if that 110k, say, gets you between someone who you think you've got a bit more confidence in to score well, or maybe, say, in the fullback spot, 110k, that gets you from, you know, James Tedesco up to maybe like a Reese Walsh. Maybe that's what you want to do. I think in those kind of instances where you are using that extra 110k, to improve like a high upside position, like a fullback or your center wing or your halves. I think compromising and starting with someone like a JMK is valid and I think it could be worth it. But if that 110K is maybe just upgrading like a 450K 2RF to like a 500, 600K guy or like in your front row forward, which is unless you're getting up to someone like a Payne Haas or Tino, I still think it's probably worth just spending that money with Grant because we know he's got this pretty consistent output and he does also have that ceiling. Just to take the analysis up a further notch as well because I get way too into it, another question was, again, similar from the one before, do we take that money from the hooker spot and target other positions? You know, spend that money in the fullback, halfback spot, and then go for the value in the hooker spot. So I think Grant versus Payne Haas. This is my own personal dilemma. I, hopefully a few of you guys also have the same thing because both of these guys are 750k. I just wanted to do a kind of comparison of like, you know, if you're going to spend 750k, do you put it in Harry Grant or do you put it in Payne Haas? So I looked at over the last four seasons, how many times has each player scored over 90 points? Harry Grant 18 times, Payne Haas 10 times. So already there's that kind of indicator of, you know, Grant has got that ceiling. Haas is probably going to be more of that consistent player. You know, a similar breakdown of looking at their averages in the season overall, pre-origin, during origin and post-origin, because I figured that would be helpful to see, okay, do historically either of these two guys perform better in that kind of pre-origin period? So Grant, 69, 86, 72, and 76 in the last four seasons. Payne Haas at 76, 68, 63, and 76. So honestly, there's not much to split them. I'd say Harry Grant's probably got the edge in that kind of pre-origin run. And when you combine the fact that Grant historically has actually outperformed someone like Payne Haas in the opening to the seasons before origin, and the fact that he's got more of the ceiling, I think... I'm getting to the point where I think the 750k is better spent on someone like Grant than someone like a Payne Haas. And just kind of doing some analysis like this got me that got me to that conclusion. I could obviously be completely wrong. Payne Haas could come out and score like three tries in the first five weeks. Grant could go in a bit of a slump and then all of this you know, is irrelevant. But I think just looking at some numbers, trying to look historically, I do think the 750k for Grant is going to be worth it if you're kind of umming and ahhing between spending that in the hook spot for Grant versus say like a front row forward. Now, if the, it's a different question, I think if you're looking at spending that money say in a half back spot or a full back spot, because that is a position that does also have similar upside, probably if not more upside to Harry Grant. So I think that's when it becomes a bit of a different consideration. So to answer the question, I think you could target other positions, you know, 110K you can save to go to JMK uh, and spend that money in a full back spot. I think that's completely valid. But taking that money out of Grant to spend it up in your maybe your second row, your front row, I, that's when I start to think maybe just lock the money into Harry Grant and just know you've got that guy who you're probably going to want to have from round six onwards and you may not actually drop that much in price in the first five weeks. So next up, going to be taking a look at some mid-range hooker options. Now you can see on the ownership stats to the right of me, none of these guys are really over, overly that popular. You can see the majority of teams out there on the socials will have one of JMK or Harry Grant and probably one of the value guys that we will speak about later in, you know, Jaden Braley, Brendan Hands, or maybe like a Joey Lusick, for example. So the mid-range category doesn't really scream that much appeal to me. I've pulled the numbers, etc. But I do also feel like, you know, looking at the list of players here, just when I talk through the numbers, it kind of leans me towards just saying, pay a little bit extra for JMK if you're considering someone in the 500s, or just try to find that money and get up to someone like uh, Harry Grant. So the mid-range options that I've got here, Blake Braley, Wade Egan, Appy Corusau, Reese Robson, Reed Marnie, and Lachlan Croker. So I'll kind of try to talk about all of them as an overall pool, because I think you're really not going to see too much ownership, I think, for these guys, and I'm particularly not really too appealed by them. One of the reasons is I think the, the price tag is a little bit awkward in this kind of, you know, between the 500 to 600k range. All of these guys are kind of priced at their average. 
there's no real value, I guess, that you would get out of these guys. Like, if you're going to try to pick these guys to, you know, try to make a little bit of extra money out of them, I kind of feel like that's going to be a little bit difficult. I'm not sure how much more money you're going to, going to get out of them. JMK, for, on the other hand, I look at a little bit differently, given that he's priced at 63, but he has showed that he can actually average 69 in his bigger minute games. So there actually does seem to be some value in JMK. A lot of these guys, though, it doesn't quite feel like it. If you look at the 90 plus games column, um, the most that any of them has is two. That was Appy Coruscant and Lock and Croker. But they just don't have that kind of upside some, to someone like a Grant. And I would have more faith in someone like a JMK with a good opening draw to maybe actually get those 90 plus games. A couple of these guys also don't play 80 minutes. So Wade Egan, for example, averaged 66 minutes. There is a Lusik somewhere in the Warriors. I can't remember if it's Freddie or Joey. Apologies. But not confident in him playing 80 minutes. And he also had some concussion and small niggly injury issues last season as well so at 576k um, draws a bit up and down with you know the Sharks Melbourne Raiders Knights doesn't scream a draw that I want to target Coruscant has the buy in round one so that's probably already going to make him uh, not very appealing to a lot of uh, super coaches Reese Robson is the most highly owned of these mid-range options at 7% owned a lot of the appeal I think is stemming from that the draw is pretty decent you know, you've got Dolphins, Dragons, Titans in the first five weeks mixed in with the Broncos and the Knights, but those two games are at home. Uh, you know, in 2022, he had a pretty good Supercoach season. He scored about 10 or 11 tries. So he actually was able to deliver, you know, quite a bit in terms of getting around that 65 average. He's also got the best base stats of any of these hooker options that I've got here. So if you look below me, average of 45 in base over the last season. So you kind of look at him thinking, you know, he's probably someone who's going to get me around that 50 to 55 each week. It's just, again, a question of he doesn't really have the ceiling. You know, he had no games over 90 last season. He does benefit from not having a buy in the kind of first six weeks. Um, so he kind of is one who I think he's got probably the most security in his role alongside Blake Braley. You know, they both averaged 79 minutes last season. I suspect that Reese Robson will be an 80-minute hooker. I think for him, it comes down to your feeling on the Cowboys. If you think the Cowboys are going to be much better than last season and if you think they're going to start like how they started in 2022 and if you think that Robson is going to go back to maybe scoring a few of those extra tries then I can see some appeal given that the draw does have some good games in there but I think if you're looking at him as having real value to get you back up to someone like a Harry Grant as I mentioned in the previous section you know Robson might get up to say 600k Grant might get down to 700k but then you're still looking to find 100k and my other concern that I didn't mention about with Harry Grant is that on round four, round five, I think you're going to, a lot of things uh, crop up, you know, players who we didn't really have any kind of idea would be good at the beginning of the season, just come out of the woodwork. Um, other guys, you know, have big slumps, there are injuries, and you do probably need to start doing trades in other positions. So trying to lock in that you're going to move up from a Robson to a Grant does feel like a strategy that, you know, could have some risk to it. You know, if you're going to start with Robson, just be comfortable that you might have to just hold him all during the first kind of 12 to 13 weeks. Similar feeling as well with uh, Blake Braley. Um, he had some good spurts uh, last season of good form, but overall kind of just did what he normally does. Average 57. He had an average of 59 in the year before that and 49 in the year before that as well. So he kind of feels to me like a guy who's kind of capped out at maybe a 60 point average, which is still three points of value. But I, I don't know. I'm just like, he's probably got the best two kind of games in the first three of Bulldogs and West Tigers. Um, and so if you think that he's going to have some additional attacking output, then maybe he could be someone to consider. But um, yeah, overall, I'm just not too enthused by this kind of pool of hookers. We haven't spoken about Reed Marnie. Like I kind of fell into that trap last season where he started off really hot, got him in round two, round three, and he just became a very kind of frustrating own. He was very inconsistent, um, only a base average of 38. So he just wasn't kind of getting you at least enough in terms of underlying you know 45 to 50 each week like he could drop those games where he would get like the low 30s and he had a lot of missed tackles so those always kept eating into his numbers um, he he relied heavily on attacking stats as well which you know he could get the draw for the, the Bulldogs is okay but again it's another thing where you need to probably have more confidence in that Bulldogs team and at the start of the season I'm more thinking maybe do I just want to stick with more of the proven guns like a Grant or maybe take a chance on who I think is a really great improving player in JMK, who's actually probably got a better draw than any of these other uh, mid-range hooker options. I'll quickly touch on a few other mid-range hooker options, more that I think could potentially become relevant um, in the latter part of the season, but for the beginning of the season, 
probably just not for me but given that their price tags are a little bit awkward around the 400k range you know we've got brandon smith at 470k he averaged 58 minutes last season and i can't really see that going up so i feel like his average of 46 is probably what you're gonna expect from brandon smith so again doesn't really scream like there's a lot of value in him Phoenix Crossland was tremendous for the Knights last season, uh, but with Jaden Braley returning, who will get on to the next section, there's probably going to be some minutes sharing, so Crossland will probably get some minutes, but he averaged 63 minutes last season. I just don't think that that's going to be that high. He may become relevant if Braley, you know, unfortunately is out, and for whatever reason, Crossland becomes like the first choice hooker again. At that point, maybe there's some value in Crossland, but just, I don't think, for the beginning of the season. Sam Verrill, Jacob Little, and Billy Walters, all kind of in this awkward mid-400 price range, all averaging around 45. Um, I don't see their minutes really that increasing that much either. So I think it, again, becomes they really need to step up themselves as uh, players and their own output needs to increase for them to really start being money makers. And again, none of these guys are really that new to the league. Like they've had a couple of seasons under their belt as well. Again, just don't see massive output from them to really generate some serious cash. So for me, probably not going to be looking in this kind of mid-range category either. Now, probably the section I think a lot of you are going to be more interested in is in the value and the cheapy options at the hooker slot. You know, this is when we start talking about Jaden Braley, Brendan Hands, uh, one of the Lussics, unfortunately, I forgot which Lussics, sorry, uh, Danny Levi from the Raiders, and also Gordon Chan Kum Tong from the Manly Sea Eagles. So we'll talk about Jaden Braley first. So I've got this quote from Barry Tui, who's very in the know with the Newcastle Knights. Someone asked a question of, are you expecting a timeshare at hooker between uh, Jaden Braley and Phoenix Crossland? And Barry Tui said, yeah, he primarily thinks at least early in the season, it would be a timeshare. And that makes sense. You know, Braley's coming back off a pretty significant injury. It would be pretty, you know, pretty shocking to see him play 80 minutes from the get-go. If you look at the stats uh, kind of to the corner, you can see that over the last five seasons, I've just taken Jaden Braley's average and also his minutes. So you can see in the seasons 2020 to 2022, he was pretty much averaging 80 minutes a game and he was pretty much averaging around 59 total points. So that's kind of his average, really, I suspect, when he would be playing 80 minutes. Last season, when he played 80-minute games, he was averaging 52. But I think we just need to discount that average, given that we don't think he's going to be playing 80 minutes. I'd probably think he's maybe playing 50 to 55. So if you scale back his minutes, I'd probably think that that average is going to go to pretty much what he averaged last season in 40. I think that's kind of what you just at least need to expect from Braley if he is going to be on reduced minutes. That means there is still some value there. He's priced at an average of 32. So you might still get like, you know, five to eight points of value and he still might make some money. I just don't think you should view him as like a must-have cheapie who's going to make boatloads of cash. I think he's just going to be a bit of a slow burn to begin the season. And again, if you're pairing him with, say, a JMK or a Harry Grant, then, you know, you're going to have to rely on him in round four or round three when that... A hooker is on the buy so you just need to be kind of happy if you're ex willing to accept that you might just only get 40 points from your hooker for that week and then you just run with the other one for the rest of your kind of pre-origin period so i've currently got braley in my team price tag is good at 330k i do still think that there is value hopefully in the preseason we get a bit more uh information around potential minutes that he's going to play but for now, he does feel kind of low risk to me in that I do think that he is going to be the starting hooker. And I do feel like he'll play at least 50 to 55 minutes. Moving on to the eel hookers in uh, Brendan Hands and Joey Lussick. They're potential alternatives to someone like Jaden Braley. Um, one thing I didn't even mention with Braley, he's 42% owned. He is actually the highest owned hooker in Supercoach currently. Uh, Brendan Hands and Joey Lussick aren't that far behind though at 11 and 5%. So I've got some stats courtesy of Supercoach Guns. Um, on Twitter, definitely give him a follow on Twitter if you don't already. He posts amazing stats and breakdowns. So Brendan Hands, last season when he played 80 minutes, averaged 55.8, and Joey Lussick, 47. And Hands is priced at an average of 33.5, and, and Lussick at 31. Why is this all relevant? Well, there was a quote that came out from Brad Arthur, which I've kind of screenshotted below me, in that he basically says that he likes the Eel Tookers to be playing 80 minutes and not kind of minutes sharing. So obviously that came out and people started thinking, oh my God, whoever a Brendan Hands or Joey Lassie comes into my team, I have to have them. Because if they're playing 80 minutes, then, you know, obviously they're well, they're probably a better option than Jaden Braley if they're playing 80 minutes. One is the draw. So I think the Eels have got a better draw than Braley to start the season. So if you look at ability to get attacking stats, it's probably already going to be a little bit higher for one of these other two guys. From the get-go, the difference if they're playing 80 minutes versus what they're priced at, they're going to give you more value and more cash generation as well than a Jaden Braley. 
I guess the biggest thing is whether can we trust what Brad Arthur said. Now, team list could help us out here massively. What would give me a lot of confidence is in that round one team list, if you don't see either one of Brendan Hands or Lusick in the overall 17, then at least for the beginning of the season, it does seem that Brad Arthur is trying to trial uh, running his hooker for 80 minutes. And so I think at that point, given that that value is probably going to be better than a Braley, I would probably start with Brendan Hands or Lusick. And also, my gut feel would be that Brendan Hands is probably going to be the one, but I really don't have any more insight into that apart from that's my yes. And why I think I'm okay to start in that way is because, you know, they're very similarly priced to Jaden Braley. And if I think they're going to offer better value, let's say if after three weeks, Brad Arthur changes his mind and he says, no, no, this isn't working. I need to have a minute sharing between my hookers. If that happens after the first month, only one price change would have happened between Brendan Hands and Braley. And they're priced so similarly. And if we think Braley's going to start out kind of slow, you're really not going to have to spend that much money, if any at all, to switch to Braley, who we think long-term is going to become closer to an 80-minute hooker for the Knights. So I do feel like if we do get that confirmation of an 80-minute hooker for Hans or Lusick, I'm more likely to start with one of them, I think, than Jaden Braley come round one. And I think that ownership, those ownership stats will also change massively come round one. Another question I did want to address in this section as well was a few questions about, is it actually a viable strategy to start with both cheap options? So say have Brendan Hands and Jaden Braley as my two starting hookers. There's obviously some serious money saving there. You're probably saving 400k between them and someone like a Harry Grant, and that 400k can go straight into someone like a Nathan Cleary. I'm not a massive fan of it, I think, at the beginning of the season, because Grant still offers that upside, and I think if it does come to a point where, you know, start of the season, it does actually look like both one of Braley or Hands or both of them are actually killing it, and they're set to make massive amounts of cash, if you at least start with a guy who's higher priced, Harry Grant, JMK, um, you can always trade down. It's very hard to do it in the opposite way though. So I'm more of the fan of having that money start in that position, just because you've got that kind of reliability and that security and expected consistency. But if one of Hands, Lusick or Braley jumps out and all of a sudden is a must have option who's gonna make boatloads of cash, you can always make that trade down. And it, it happens at a very convenient time as well where JMK has got a buy in round three, Harry Grant's got to buy it in round four. Those could be weeks where, you know, hopefully the picture is clear for you and you could easily make that trade and you can easily justify it to yourself because you say, well, my hooker's got to buy it. He's not going to be playing. Let me move down and make some cash. And then you can use that cash to make those big upgrades when you know a little bit more about who are the better prospects um, once you've actually in entered into the season. So I can see the strategy potentially working at the start of the season. It's going to rely on you, I think, once you've taken that cash out, reliably guessing who's going to be the person who's going to offer you those points. I'm much more of the camp of I'd rather start with a higher price guy who I think very consistently will offer me around that 70 to 75 points in Grant or maybe 65 to 70 in JMK with the flexibility that I can trade down to someone cheaper if they do emerge at the beginning of the season. A couple of other cheapy options I've got here, Danny Levi from the Raiders and Gordon Chan Kumtong from the Sea Eagles. Um, with Chan Kum Tong, I'm not overly keen on him. I suspect he will potentially get a number 14 spot for the Sea Eagles, but Lachlan Croker is going to be there. He averaged around 70 minutes a game last season for Manly, so I kind of look at it as Gordon's probably only going to get like a 10 to 15 minute roll. So even though he's bottom dollar at 238k, uh, I don't really see him in those really reduced minutes being able to get like enough output to make any money. Maybe one to consider though if there's like a potential injury to Croker. Uh, with Danny Levi, you know, he's probably more likely going to be playing bigger minutes. You know, predicted team list that I've seen have him as a starting number nine for Canberra. But there's always that risk of one, Ricky Stewart, and also probably Tom Starling is going to be on the bench as well for the Raiders. And I just don't have a lot of confidence in the Raiders number nine to really be a serious option who's going to make kind of, you know, decent money for the beginning of the season. You know, if I look at someone like Zach Wolford last year for the Raiders, he averaged 50 minutes and his average points was 35. I kind of feel like similar thing could just happen with Danny Levi. Even if that 35 goes up to say 40, sure, you're going to get about 17 points of value, which is quite good. But my concern is that if you start with him and then it's not looking good at the beginning already, at bottom dollar, you're going to have to find a lot of money to try to upgrade to someone like a JMK. You're even going to have to try to find close to 100K just to get up to Braley or Brendan Hands. So I'm not a massive fan of Danny Levi. I kind of feel like even if he gets 50 minutes, just the Raiders number nine traditionally is not a position. I think that is a high scoring position um, from the Canberra team. So I'm not overly keen on Danny Levi. My preferred hooker combination would either be one of Grant, JMK and like a Brent, uh, Braley or Brennan Hands, or even potentially doing Hands and Braley. 
I'm not too keen on starting with uh, Danny Levi personally. Alright guys, that is my deep dive on the hooker position. Hopefully you all enjoyed the video and some of those more detailed stats. If you did, really appreciate a thumbs up and if you please consider subscribing as well to the channel to see more position breakdowns and videos during the 2024 preseason and the entire season as well. Um, so you won't miss a video as well if you do subscribe. Thank you everyone and see you all in the next one.